All right, well, good to see you, New Story Church. Uh, my name is Dustin. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it is my honor to be able to teach God's word today. This is the last sermon in a series about spiritual warfare, and we've been learning about how we can stand against the schemes of Satan, and it's by wearing these different pieces of the spiritual armor. And so just to recap, and I need a little bit of participation from you guys, we learn about the belt of, one more time, the belt of truth, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, breastplate of, shield of, sword of the spirit, which is the word of, and the helmet of, and the nunchucks of, Glory. Yes, that's the last one. You guys might have missed it. Nunchucks of glory is very important. Um, but what else is there to talk about? Uh, we've talked about every single piece of the spiritual armor. Why do we still need to be in this series? Well, every piece of the armor has been talked about, but the passage does not end there. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, continues on. So we're going to read through this passage together. And I'm going to start us off. And if you can join in when you see the bolded yellow portion. So let's get into Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And all together, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. So at the end of this passage, why is there this talk about prayer? I mean, isn't truth enough? Isn't righteousness enough? Isn't faith enough? Isn't salvation enough? And the point that this passage is making is that communication with God is necessary if we want to experience God's strength and his might. See, that passage in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 starts by saying, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Meaning that this entire passage is teaching us how we can find strength and power in God. And it's ultimately found in prayer. Have you ever experienced times when you needed strength, when you felt weak, when you felt like you didn't have enough to continue on. Maybe where you couldn't overcome the sins and the struggles because they were just too tempting, or you felt overwhelmed by depression and anxiety. Maybe you couldn't stop hearing that accusatory voice in your head. So there are times in our lives where we feel weak, and this passage teaches us that we need to pray. It's interesting because this passage does not teach us all the details of prayer. 
It doesn't expound on what prayer is. It doesn't give us a template for prayer. It simply commands us to pray. And maybe the reason is that even if we don't understand all the complexities and the inner workings of prayer, still when we pray, we experience the power of God in our lives. Now, there's a caveat. Eugene Peterson says, the starting point for prayer must be God's word. And that's true. The more we understand God's word, the more aligned our prayers will be with the heart of God. But we don't need to be a seasoned Christian or have read every single passage on prayer to begin praying. But the moment we go to God expressing our weakness, and we begin to lean on him, God hears our prayers, and he responds to our prayers. So what is prayer? There have been many people who have written about prayer who have great things to say about this topic. Several of them are mentioned here. John Knox, he says that prayer is in earnest and familiar talking with God. John Calvin says prayer is an intimate conversation of the pious with God. John Owen says, prayer is a communion of men with God. So at its core, prayer is conversation with God. And in the passage that we'll be diving into today, it teaches us when we are to pray. It teaches us how we are to pray. And it teaches us what we are to pray. So we're going to dive into the when, the how, and the what of prayer. And if you are ready, can I hear you say amen? Amen. All right. I love it. Here we go. When are we to pray? We are to pray at all times. Look at someone next to you. Say, we are to pray at all times. At all times. When we are sad, when we are happy, in times of despair and in times of hope, when we experience new relationships in life and when we lose those relationships, when we begin new jobs and when we lose those jobs. In the morning, in the afternoon, at night, in the summer, in the spring, in the fall, in the winter, at all times, we are called to pray. But here's the problem. Prayer does not come naturally. Because the practice of prayer is the acknowledgement of self-insufficiency. And in going to God in prayer, we are saying, God, I don't know enough. God, I don't have enough. God, I don't have the strength that I need to go about this situation. And that does not come natural. Because our natural tendencies are to rely on ourselves. So how do we get ourselves to pray? And how do we learn to denounce self-sufficiency and learn to turn to God? And how do we do this when there is an enemy at work who is constantly doing all that he can do so that our prayer lives would be diminished? To answer this, I think it's important to talk about the difference between praying in times of peace and in times of pain. And what I've come to find is that oftentimes in seasons of pain, it actually becomes a little bit easier for us to pray. Pain has a way of leading us back to God. And C.S. Lewis says, Pain insists upon being attended to, meaning this, that when we experience pain, we can't ignore it. We cannot brush it off, that our attention gets focused on that pain. And we begin to focus not only on that pain itself, but also the origin of that pain. And as we begin to ask these existential questions, oftentimes that leads us to God. I know that this season has been difficult for many of us. 
We've gone through heartbreak. We've gone through health struggles, mental health struggles. We've seen relationships fall apart. We've experienced betrayal. We felt senses of hopelessness and loneliness. In these moments, Satan will do all he can to distort our view of God. He would cause us to see all that is happening that is wrong in our lives and try to get us to focus on that instead of the goodness of God in our lives. And he tempts us to believe that God doesn't care and that God is not near to us. But the truth is, God is not removed from your circumstances, but God is right there with you. In those moments of pain, in those moments of struggle, that God is right there with you through it all. And that the suffering in this world is caused not by God, but by Satan and our own wrongdoing. But what Satan and this world intends for our undoing, God can use to build us up. And so do not push aside the only one who fully knows you and fully loves you and will constantly be present with you as you continue on in this season of difficulty. It was in a personal season of pain that God taught me how to pray. Where prayer wasn't a routine or a ritual, but it was me depending on God for strength and sustenance because I needed him. And if you are in a season of pain, it's not easy to go through. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. And it's the light that you may experience God in deeper ways than you could ever experience without that pain in your life. So turn to God in the season of pain. But what about seasons of peace? When things are going our way, I find that it actually is harder to turn to God in prayer in these times. Because when everything is comfortable, there is a strong temptation to believe that we no longer have a need for God in our lives. How do we pray in these moments? James 1.17 says that every single good and perfect gift comes from above. And I believe that in these seasons, if we can recognize that behind every blessing in our life, there is a blesser, then we can have such deep and rich times of prayer with God. See, Satan doesn't care if we see blessings. He doesn't care if we receive gifts. As long as we do not see the God behind these gifts and these blessings, he's OK with it. But in these moments of our lives, if we can see that there is the hand of God extended to us, pouring out upon us, your prayer life can also be so deep and so rich. Have you ever gone throughout your day and just thanked God for all that is happening? Where you just wake up in the morning time and, and you say, God, thank you for these new mercies today. Or you're about to enjoy some food, and you just pause and say, God, thank you that you have never let me go hungry. Or you're sitting across from someone that you just love so much, and you say, God, thank you for this person in my life. Or you go to, to sleep at night. Before you fall asleep, you just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this life that I get to live. If you learn to turn to God with thanksgiving, 
Your seasons of peace can become seasons of deep prayer. So in times of pain, turn to God because he is a good God and he is there for you. In times of peace, turn to God because he is the one who blesses you with everything that is good in your life. But here's the next question that this passage addresses, which is, how are we to pray? Ephesians 6, 18 says, pray at all times in the spirit. Look at someone next to you and say, pray in the spirit. What does praying in the spirit mean? It means that we are guided and empowered by the spirit of God. Romans 8, 26 says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. In other words, there are times when we do not know what to pray, either because the situations that we are in are so overwhelming or maybe our hearts are just so divided that we don't know what to pray. And the Spirit of God comes between us and God, and he leads us into the throne room of God through prayer. And this plays out in different ways. Maybe you, you're reading through Scripture and all of a sudden, there is this burden that has been placed on your heart, and you just need to begin praying for that. Or maybe you're in a, a personal time of prayer, and without knowing why, there is someone that God is just highlighting to you. You realize you need to pray for that person. And you can't help but pray for that individual, even though you don't understand all that is happening in that person's life. Or maybe a, a group prayer time where you start to find that the Holy Spirit begins to knit hearts together. And you start praying for the same thing with the same kind of urgency. But not only are we to pray in the Spirit, we are also to pray with constant alertness. Look at someone next to you and say, pray with alertness. Ephesians 6, 18 says that. It says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. To keep alert means to always be vigilant. It means to always keep watch because spiritual warfare will come at any moment. There is a book called The Good Soldiers by David Finkel, and he describes the experience of Sergeant Adam Schumann. The sergeant was entrusted with the role of keeping watch many times throughout his time of duty during the Iraqi war. And in one section of this book, it describes his experience. And this is what it says. Schumann was standing guard on the roof again, a cigarette dangling from his lips, his M4 hanging from his neck, looking out toward the desert. The sun was going down. The sky was turning orange. The whole world seemed peaceful, but he knew better. The longer he stood there, the more he saw. The more he wondered when the next bomb would come, the next sniper, the next ambush. He stood there, his heart beating hard in his chest, waiting, always waiting for what was next. This experience describes the call for followers of God, as we are to stay vigilant, to stay alert to the spiritual warfare that is to come. And if we've never noticed 
any spiritual warfare around us, it's not because that spiritual warfare is not happening. It's because our eyes are not open to that spiritual warfare that is happening. And it's important to realize that those thoughts in our mind that say that all things are hopeless and there's no point in continuing on, that could be spiritual warfare. The temptation to believe that lust is just natural, that could be the whisper of Satan in your life. The feeling that life is not worth living, that could be the enemy at work. Or even that increasing annoyance that we feel towards that one person who is sitting next to us today, that could be spiritual. That was just a joke, I hope. (laughs) But these things might be spiritual. So Paul's point is we need to have our eyes open to the spiritual warfare that is around us. Be alert with all perseverance, because warfare will come at any moment. So how are we to pray? We are to pray in the spirit and with constant alertness. But lastly, what are we to pray? We are to pray all prayers and especially supplications. It says this in Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So pray all different kinds of prayer and especially prayers where you express your need to God. There are several different types of prayer in Scripture. And the majority of them fall into four main categories. And you might have heard of this type of prayer, this model of prayer before, these four categories of prayer. And there's an acronym with the word ACTS. And these are the four different types of prayer as described by this acronym ACTS. The first is the prayer of adoration. These are prayers that praise God for who he is. It's centering one's heart on the character of God before bringing up other prayer requests to this God. I find that this is actually a great way to start our prayer because it helps us see God more clearly. Psalm 63, verse 3 through 4 says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. The next kind of prayer is confession. And these are prayers that acknowledge sin and seek forgiveness from God. Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If we lose sight of the importance of confession, We not only lose sight of the sin in our lives, but we lose sight of the love of Jesus in our lives as well. It is important that we not only see the sins of those around us, but also the sins that are within us. Prayers of confession are so important if we want to pray in a way that aligns ourselves with God's word. The next prayer is the prayer of thanksgiving. And these are prayers that thank God for what he has done. First Chronicles 16, verse 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
And lastly, there's the prayer of supplication, which are prayers that express our needs to God. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God's heart for us is that instead of worrying, we would turn to God in prayer. Instead of just stressing out about all the things that we need to happen in our lives, that we would ask God to intervene in our circumstances. Many of you have asked, Pastor Dustin, how was your, your sabbatical time? Did you go to a lot of places? How was it? And yes, like we, we did go places and it was great. But you know what was so special about the sabbatical that I was on? It was times of prayer when I was able to go to God without feeling anxious about something else that I needed to get done. And a lot of the prayers time, the prayer times that my wife Jennifer and I had together we use this model of prayer, acts. Start of the day and just spend time with the Lord using this prayer model. And it was so good for us. And, and as good as my time was, just engaging with godly people, gleaning from amazing ministries, spending time in great books, some of my most cherished times were just coming before the Lord, finding strength in Him in my times of prayer. This passage calls us to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And it continues on. It says, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Why does Paul call the church to pray? Because the gospel needs to be spread. And if you think about it, what does spiritual warfare boil down to? that Satan and his army of demons would do all that they could do so that the gospel would not be shared. And that's why our prayers matter. It's because lives matter and souls matter. If you want to know the secret to someone's faith-filled life, you only have to look into their prayer life. I truly believe that. And behind every single man and woman of God, there are countless numbers of unseen hours spent in prayer. Reese Howells was one of those men. He was someone who literally engaged in warfare through prayer. He was a Welsh missionary. And his way of fighting against the Nazis in Germany was through prayer. And his prayers changed the course of history. He started up a school called the Bible College of Wales. And together with this group, they prayed throughout this war. Here are some of these stories. In the spring of 1940, the Allied forces were trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk in northern France. They were surrounded by advancing German troops. And with no apparent escape, the situation seemed pretty bleak. Rees and his intercessors at the Bible College of Wales were burdened by the plight of the soldiers, so they began devoting themselves to intense prayer. They gathered daily. They interceded. And as they prayed, the weather conditions changed unexpectedly so that a civilian flotilla of boats reached Dunkirk and rescued 300,000 men. 
This later became known as the miracle of Dunkirk, and it was a direct answer to prayer. The Battle of Britain was fought later that summer, and this was an aerial struggle between German and British forces. And if the Germans won, this would pave the way for an invasion of Britain. Rees recognized how important Britain was in this war. And so he and his, his friends, they intensified their prayers. And they prayed for the protection of the British pilots and the defeat of the German Air Force. And even though the British were heavily outnumbered, they repelled the German attack, which many believed was a sign of divine intervention. The war continued. And in June of 1944, the Allies launched the D-Day invasion of Normandy, which was part of the German-occupied zone of France. Rees and his team prayed for favorable weather conditions, the safety of the troops, and the success of this invasion. There was initial resistance, but eventually the Allied forces made progress. And the success of D-Day was seen as a direct answer to the prayers of Howells and his community. Throughout World War II, Rees was praying. He believed in the power of prayer to experience God's strength and to overcome evil. And can you imagine how different our world would be if God's church viewed prayer in the same way, with the same kind of intensity, with the same kind of faith and conviction. Can you imagine how the course of history would be altered? You know what prayer is? In spiritual warfare, prayer is rebellion against the status quo of evil in our world. It's saying, I see the evil all around me, and because of that, I cannot stand that. I will not stand for that. And instead, I'm going to turn to God in prayer. And I believe that history can be changed as I turn to God. So now we're going to go into a time of prayer, because there's no better way to respond to a message on prayer than to pray. I'm going to guide you through this act prayer model. And can I, can I actually invite this group to stand to their feet? Because I really believe that there is an urgency to our prayers. I believe that God calls his people to pray with faith and intensity and passion. And so let's do that today. We're going to start with adoration. We first look to God and we declare who he is. A God who is good, a God who is just, a God who brings peace, a God of grace, a God of love, a God who cares. And there are times when we need to be silent and contemplative. But if I can just ask this group today that this time would be something different, where we can turn to God, express our prayers to Him with a passion, with a fervor, with an intensity. And so let's start. We can just lift up our voices and don't be bashful. 
But let's begin to pray prayers of adoration, declaring who God is. Because this is going to be the foundation for the rest of the prayers that we lift up. So with our eyes closed, with our heads bowed, in a posture of humility, let's begin to lift up our voices in prayer, declaring who God is. Let's pray, church. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you, God, with our voices lifted up to you. We declare that you are a God who is perfect in every way. We declare that you are a God who is good. We declare that you are a God who loves so deeply. Father, maybe some of us have forgotten that. So right now, God, we just declare, Lord, that you are a God of love. You are a God of love, a God who has not forsaken us, a God who has not left us, but a God who is right here with us, wherever we might be. You are that kind of God. You are a God of power. You are a God who has all things in his hands. That's the kind of God that you are. You are a God of miracles. You are a God who does the impossible to reveal his glory to the world. That's the kind of God who you are. You're a God who is so perfect. God who is so holy. Guys, if we can take some time and just come before the Lord and, and just recognize his holiness and just recognize how perfect he is. Scripture says that he is a God who is so set apart that if we were to see him, he would not live because of how holy he is. And if we can just recognize that, God who is perfect in every way, a God who is an unapproachable light, and that leads us to our next prayer, a prayer of confession. If we are followers of Jesus, we should see our sins a lot more clearly than the sins of others. We should point out our own sins more than the sins of other people around us. And the moment that we lose sight of the cross, we lose sight of the beauty of the grace of Jesus in our lives. If your relationship with God is not fresh, if your relationship with God is not exciting, most likely it's because you've lost sight of how much you need the grace of Jesus in your life. But this is a time where we confess our sins and our brokenness to him. And let's come before the Lord. Let's not have any masks or pretenses, but let's just confess all the wrong things that we've thought, all the wrong things that we've said, all the wrong things that we've done, all the right things that we have not done. Let's bring that before the Lord in confession right now. Let's pray, church. Let's pray. Father, we come with hearts that are broken by our sin. God, we come acknowledging, Lord, that there are so many things in our lives that just don't please you, ways that our hearts have become distracted, ways that we've made idols for ourselves. God, we confess those things to you, Lord. We 
We confess our pride. We confess our greed. We confess the ways that we push you aside because we put school above you. We put our work above you. We put ourselves above you. God, would you forgive us? Would you forgive me, Lord? For how quickly I forget you, how quickly I lose sight of your grace, how quickly I become distracted, how quickly I turn to other things instead of you, or I allow my pride to lead me. How much I give in to the desires of the flesh. Lord, I confess that to you today, Lord. Before we continue on, if there are people in your life you have not forgiven, I, I just really believe that the Spirit of God is grieved when we hold on to bitterness. And if that is your confession, would you bring that to God? Say, Lord, I'm sorry for harboring this bitterness. I've been holding on to all the bad this person has done to me, and I don't want to hold on to that anymore. And so if you would just pray that prayer of confession to Him, saying, Lord, I am sorry. I am sorry. Forgive me. Next, we're going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Thanking God for all the good that He has done in our lives. If you want to start somewhere, start with the salvation that He offers to all of us through Jesus. Start with the hope that that gives you. Start with the joy that that gives you. Start with the purpose that salvation gives to you. And then move on. Thank Him for the relationships that you cherish so much. Thank Him for the provision that He offers to you in your life. Thank you for his constant presence. Even if you mess up, begin to thank him for all the good that he has done in your life. There are so many things that God does for us that we don't recognize. And so let's come before him with hearts of thanksgiving and let's just appreciate him and show gratitude to him for all that he is doing. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you so much, God. I thank you for the joy of my salvation, Lord. I did not deserve it. I did not earn it. But God, in my brokenness, you saw me and you loved me and you offered me a way out. I thank you, God, that on my worst days with you, God, they are way better than any day I had before you in my life. Father, I thank you for the joy. I thank you for the purpose. I thank you for the glorious call that you have given to me. I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you for the brothers and the sisters that I get to do life with. I thank you, Lord, that in these relationships, there is something way deeper than just a common interest. There is something so much deeper than just a shared experience. Lord, that what unites us is the blood of Jesus. I thank you for that, God. I thank you, Lord, for those who pray, who pray for this church, who pray for me. I thank you for those who encourage others, who honor others, and who encourage me to continue running this race. And lastly, there are needs in our lives, and this is the prayer of supplication. 
Some of us have been worrying so much and praying so little. And I cannot begin to tell you how many prayers God has answered because I just turned to Him in prayer. And I want this group, if you haven't yet experienced the power of God in your life through prayer, I want you to experience that so much. And maybe today would be the beginning if you haven't experienced that yet. What is that need in your life? What are those needs in your life where you need the hand of God to come and change circumstances? Whatever that is, tell God that need. Is there a situation where you are just struggling? Tell that to God. Are there mental health struggles? Is there despair and anxiety in your life? Tell that to God. Do you need a job? Tell that to God. Do you need his help overcoming sin in your life? Tell that to him. Is there physical healing that you need? Tell that to God. Guys, I, I've seen him answer every single one of these prayer topics. And I want to challenge you to pray in faith today, just believing, believing, even if a small amount of belief, but believing that God would hear your prayers. So would you begin to lift up your voices to him? Would you begin to tell God what it is that you need from him? Let's begin to pray those prayers, guys. Let's pray. Father, we come before you with need. We come before you. We don't want to worry. We don't want to stress. We don't want to feel anxious. We don't want to feel despair. Instead, God, we want to turn to you, a God who has all things in control. And we say, God, please provide for us. Please take care of these needs. God, I pray for those who need physical healing, even in this room. I pray that you would touch them right now that they would experience the power of God. For those online who are struggling with mental health struggles to the point where they are too fearful to come out in person, I pray, Lord, that you would move in their hearts even right now. Father, for those of us who cannot overcome sin and we need to experience not only the forgiveness, but the freedom that you offer through the gospel, Father, would you move right now? Father, for those of us who want to see our loved ones come to faith, God, would you stir up hearts of those loved ones, even right now? God, we come before you with our needs.